from Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here, and coming up today, K-State's Dan O'Brien with his weekly segment on the grain price trends. He will preview the USDA's grain supply and demand report out within the hour, and he'll remark on the staying power of the current strength in the grain markets. Then K-State's Terry Griffin will invite you producers to take part in a new initiative called the Data Intensive Farm Management Project. It'll make available to participants precision cropping analytical tools to evaluate site-specific crop management in real-life situations on one's farm. And K-State's Mary Knapp is standing by to visit about Kansas agricultural weather with us. All this and more directly ahead on Agriculture Today. Make hand-washing a healthy habit everywhere you go. Wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, especially after going to the bathroom, before, during, and after preparing food, and before eating. If soap and water aren't available, use a hand sanitizer that has at least 60% alcohol. Life is better with clean hands. A message from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. This is the K-State Radio Network, and we're glad to have you along for Agriculture Today. Well, the grain market's a pleasure to report upon once again as we touch base once more with Dan O'Brien, grain market economist, K-State Research and Extension. Dan, it's been another week of producer-friendly trends in the grain markets, although the rally did take a pause yesterday. Yeah, generally more positive prices. And I think you see it in where prices are trending around or where they have been here uh, in the days just leading up to where we're at now. Here we have these corn futures for this year, somewhere around 390, 395 thereabouts, you know, up, up and down some, let's say around 390 thereabouts. And these 21 new crop, just a little bit above that at 395. Now, if we go all the way through this marketing year and have a great crop, for 2021, we probably still won't be at 395. But given what we don't know right now, 2021 is 395. So that's that's thought provoking. November soybeans 1057. November 2021 967, and that comes and not not without causality, I guess. Reports from South America that they intend to have a tremendous record high soybean crop again. Now that's in spite of dry conditions that they have. So they're assuming they'll overcome all that crop and get in, be no problem. And again, that, that crop, and here we're sitting here in October, they're getting ready to plant, being preparation for all that uh, as we speak, heading off in the next several months, depending on where, where they're at, you know, on, on the world map. So anyway, their anticipation is that they're going to get rainfall. It'll all work well. The one thing I wonder on that that's a big play in world markets is that, you know, we do have confirmation of a La Nina mm-hmm. weather event. And uh, one of my old mentors um, from Iowa State, Elwin Taylor, indicated that you know, when we get into years like that, Anything goes, you know, you can have, you can have a whole lot of volatility. In fact, years ago, you and I interviewed Elwin right. at one of our risk and profit conferences. And he talked about that very thing. Of course, he might, he'd say, well, a uh, La Nina year is 51% chance of a problem. Well, come on, Elwin. <laughs> a little more than that. A little more but, definitive than that. Right. But the point is that there's high risk of that. And here they're dry there and uh, Australia sounding that alarm, no doubt. And uh, when you look at world weather maps, it's dry in a whole lot of areas. So when Brazil comes out and says, man, we're going to have a big crop next year, and you see a new crop 21 soybean futures for November uh, down basically 90 cents from where, where we're at right now, that's that's what the world's kind of dialing in. But not so much for corn because uh, you get a little different deal. I would say for, you know, as you talked about the trends in the in the markets, hard red winter wheat yesterday trading around 530, 535, they're about. Just interesting as all as all get out that that that's decent new crop July five fifty one up about nineteen cents from there, and you know we kind of get conditioned to what we've just had, but that's five thirty two and five fifty one. That's not four thirty two and four fifty one. So these issues that we've seen 
in world wheat production, talk about Australia, but particularly Black Sea region, you know, they're causing concern to the to the world. Europe has these issues. It, it's always interesting to me to listen to weather and crop news out of the Black Sea region. You'll see one report that says, oh, they can't get the crop. And the next one says, oh, it's just going to be wonderful. So it, it depends which agency with which motivation is talking about where those crops are. So we've got, we got things happening all over, but we're coming into this report. We're kind of primed for surprises that can move the market one way or the other. Before we get into what the trade thinks about that report and what it'll have to say, though, we do have to acknowledge, Dan, that export sales are the short-term force behind the latest price improvements. Yes. Uh, when, when you look on a week-to-week basis, what our corn, sorghum, and soybean sales have been, they're, they're up on a week-to-week basis, which is an impetus to the market. You, you know, that's the shipments. The sales can be up and down. But uh, again, it, just as we even look at the news uh, coming into basically Thursday morning, sales of soybeans for delivery to China, Mexico, and, and unknown destinations. It just that pump keeps going and going and going. So that's supportive of the soybean market. To the degree, when you look at at soybean futures right now, the upfront contracts, November and January are, say, 1050, 1060, something like that, both just about the same, and then it trails off from there. So market is saying we're worried in the short run, but in the long run, we think there's going to be a response. But that said, kind of a level market for corn, you know, it's not quite the big upfront jump and for wheat, a little bit of carry, too. So right now, of the major ag markets that we watch, soybean sure is the, is, is the leading impetus on pulling their prices and having some carryover influence on these other prices and pulling them higher. Well, then, what is the trade thinking about what the USDA will share here a little later on out of the World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates? Of course, grain stocks domestically and abroad are the uh, main ingredient there that most are interested in? Well, when you look at corn supply demand balance sheet leading to those ending stocks, uh, general expectation is for a, a projection of about 14.8 billion bushels of corn. Uh, that would be down 100 million from the September report. And ending stocks uh, projected to be, for corn, about 2.1 billion bushels. In, in that last September report, the WASDE report, it was uh, 2.5, so down 400 million. And of course, what's coming into there also is that uh, the results of that stocks report that came out, you know, last day of September, and higher feed residual usage, and that so that's in play on this. Uh, for soybeans, projection of about 4.28 billion bushel crop is general trade estimate. That compares to that September number of 4.31, so you know about 80 million bushels less production than the USDA projected before. And the, the soybean ending stocks figure in September is 460 million. Now it's projected 370. So, you know, 90 million bushels less. That's still 360 million. We used to scoff at that when we were down about 100 to 200. But now this is a pretty big deal, you know, because you're, you're, you're getting down to 10% stocks to use or less and strength of exports on the demand side pulling it in. So anything we have, to kind of shock the supply in with the lower U.S. production, going to be responded to a lot more, a lot more vigorously than it would have been if, if we had just so-so demand. So it's tightening up, and that, that's where that's coming from. And, and for wheat, again, the, with the results of that small grains summary report, generally that's uh, thought to work its way through the supply demand balance sheet and end up at, and bring us to something below 900 million bushels of, of uh, ending stocks for this marketing year that we're in for wheat. And that'd be down for about 925. So a, re- a reduction of about 35 million bushels. So we're in a mode now that we, we didn't think we'd be in this summer, really. Here we're coming into the October WASDE report and crop production reports for the fall harvested crops moving lower. And stocks with the impetus of exports now coming into play, we're anticipating tangible reductions in ending stocks for this report coming up. So that sets us up. If we get more than that, and the market's kind of thinking that, you know, they they have expectations coming into reports like we're going to see in a few minutes. And if they're met, well, then, hey, we've already got a bid in. But if we miss to the higher low side, well, we get an opposite reaction on the price. So it's there's potential for this. And I, I don't want to be just a downer guy. But if anything, we've seen of late, it's, it's that the USDA, in trying to be responsible, 
you know, they don't jump on short crop numbers real quickly. In fact, their pattern last two years has been to, to base their estimates on what, what they had earlier and then go back and, and figure out about several months later on their stocks report that, hey, we were about 80, 90 million bushels too high on those crops. That's something to bear in mind that our recent pattern has been pretty cautious in adjusting for anything on the low side for production. That said, fall harvest is motoring along largely unabated here in Kansas and the region, and producers have to be wondering, again, how much upside is left in these markets. This USDA report out very soon will help steer that to a certain degree, but over the longer pull, that's a question that everybody would like to know the answer to, Dan. Well, it's almost to the degree that you know, I'm not sure how many more surprises we can really have on this on the production side. We have a pretty good idea. Yeah, there's some risks out there, et cetera. But uh, right now, I think our, our attention with these harvests uh, getting closer to either being done or pretty well known, we'll be looking at the potential for demand pull. So, you know, we're set up for a situation that has, was it 20, 30, 40% chance of being a pretty volatile year if you have crop shortfalls. Add all that in, and yeah, we got elections and all sorts of other things going on in the U.S. economy. And so uh, it's just liable to be from October through November and December just a, a very interesting time. <laughs> just be very interesting. And if there are economic shocks, that most of the time that's not helpful to act. So, so anybody looking at these markets, if there are opportunities, you would wonder about being more proactive than normal to at least set floors to protect yourself, given these outside systematic things that could come and affect the U.S. economy and financial markets and make their way to the grains. Very well. We always appreciate the insight, Dan. Thanks. Enjoy your weekend. Thanks, Eric. Take care. Our regular Friday guest to discuss the grain market trends with us, Dan O'Brien, is a grain market economist, K-State Research and Extension, and you're listening to agriculture today a social distancing tip putting distance between yourself and others is critical to slowing the spread of coronavirus so here are ways to stay in contact without the physical contact part call send a text set up a video conference post on social media dedicate a song on the radio if you have symptoms of fever dry cough and shortness of breath call your health care provider before going to their office for more info visit coronavirus.gov let's all do our part Because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. You're listening to Agriculture Today, continuing on now by informing you crop producers who have a bent toward precision agriculture, technology, and management. There's a unique opportunity being presented to you that we'll hear about today from our guest, who happens to be one of the uh, local coordinators, if you will, of this initiative in Kansas. He is Terry Griffin, precision agricultural economist with K-State Research and Extension. Terry, something's afoot called the Data Intensive Farm Management Project. And this is being sponsored by a grant from the USDA. What is this all about? Well, Eric, this was started in University of Illinois with Dave Bullock, and we've got a group across 18 states. And the idea is we've been trying to develop ways of analyzing data that comes from our combines and cotton pickers and conducting analysis of on-farm experiments that farmers have been you know, doing themselves you know, over many decades and we're trying to uh, develop these tools to analyze the data, to manage that data. And we're ready to push some of these things from the research and applied research side to the farm and make these available. And hopefully that these will be picked up by you know, the farm management information software and another farm mapping software to be used uh, at the farm level from here on out. Well, how will this work, the mechanics of this project? You say the idea here is to introduce tools that have been researched and developed. How will you and others involved in this introduce these tools to producers? So there's 18 states in this project sponsored by NRCS. Farmers will be able to partner with someone from the team. So we have uh, people who will be dedicated to 
uh, assist farmers with the design of the experiments and what to do and some advice on what not to do and provide some resources. Um, the farmers, private consultants can take part in this. There's some subsidies that both of those parties can, can apply for to help offset some of the you know, expenses. It's not enough to pay them to be researchers, but it will pay to uh, offset some of the costs that they incur from participating. Being more specific about the actual field tasks that you're looking at here, fertilizer and seeding management seem to be the two around which this revolves. Is that correct? That is. So those are the two big ones that most of the questions we have revolve around. And a lot of times it's not only the, you know, which hybrid is best for my farm under my management style, but what rate of seeds per acre or what rate of nitrogen per acre should we use. And one of the downsides of conducting that type of research is you really need to have really low rates and really high rates in order for us to statistically estimate that curve. And you know what happens when you put on no seed, you make no corn. And so there is some funding to offset those uh, reductions in farmer revenue as well. So we are focusing in on hybrid varieties, seeding rates, fertility rates, and so forth. An example, if you would, or two, of the exact tools that might be introduced as part of this format. Well, we've talked about yield monitors before on your show. Mm-hmm. And you know, yield monitor technology goes back to at least the early 90s, probably longer than that. But farmers have been making use of this technology for many decades, or at least they have access to the technology and asking the question, how do we make use of this technology? Well, looking at the USDA arms survey, farmers who produce corn, soybean, cotton, wheat, they ranked how often they use yield monitors and told us how they use that data. And For corn and beans, the number one use of yield monitor wasn't really the yield monitor, but the moisture sensor that comes um, with it. Monitoring crop moisture at harvest was the number one use of yield monitor. The third highest use by corn and soybean producers in those years, they reported that conducting their own on-farm experiments were the third highest use of a yield monitor. So the yield monitor and other ag technology, the variable rate systems uh, are going to be used. The variable rate will be used to implement the experiments. So we will design an experiment that will be on the go. So it won't you know, require measurement tapes and flags and, and a lot of human capital when the experiment is implemented. And yield monitors, the data will be collected as part of it. But then... All of our listeners who have used a yield monitor realizes that, hey, it's not as simple getting that data from the combine to the computer as we would like for it to be. So there's a data management process that will track that part of it. And once we get to a computer, we've got some automated algorithms. That's our new word, automated (laughs) algorithms. We've talked about cleaning yield monitor data before. We've done this with CARTA, hosted some workshops with KSRE. Well, we've got some automated ways of cleaning yield monitor data that we want to test on many, many farms. And that's one of the tools. You can call it data management. You can call it analysis. kind of fits in both. But we wanted to uh, take some of our ideas that we've developed in the laboratory or on a laptop and see uh, how these perform relative to more manual techniques such as yield editor. So uh, cleaning yield monitor data is a part of it. And then if you get really excited about analysis, we're going to apply different types of spatial statistical analysis and determine which ones are more similar to each other. How long does it take to do these things? And can we move those techniques away from a research computer and put it into a a smaller device that would be, let's say, on the combine, on farm equipment, instead of being a dedicated research computer. We're hoping for this to be a a wide spectrum of tools that will kind of alleviate all the bottlenecks we've been dealing with for decades. Mm -hmm. And as far as implementation here, the experimental setup, will it be standardized across participating farms or tailored to the individual farm? 
Uh, we're hoping to use the regional approach so that uh, farmers who want to participate can be a replica of a larger experiment. Although we're not going to say that individualized experiments will not be considered for this either. We're, we're wanting to pressure test the statistical analysis and data management techniques that we've been developing from an applied research perspective. Then, Terry, how deep into precision agriculture does a producer need to be to really qualify for this project? Well, at the very least, a yield monitor, calibrated yield monitor, needs to be present on the harvester. Uh, that is um, kind of the bare minimum. And, you know, looking at our statistics from Kansas Farm Management Association, the KFMA data, we suggest about 40% of Kansas farms have a yield monitor with a GPS on it. And in as far as support for participation, and you mentioned this, there are certain financial subsidies that can be provided to producers as well as those that they'll be working with on this project to see it through, right? There is. Uh, so there's an annual participation staff in for each farm uh, who wants to participate of $1,000. And like I said earlier, if, if you're looking at, let's say, a seeding rate study and your very low rates and very high rates cause yield penalties, yield drag, then there's some uh, compensation for profit losses that will come through those types of events. The private consultants can participate, helping researchers develop the software. There's up to $3,000 that can be split between the farmer and, and crop consultant on each project. By the sound of it, you have great aspirations for this project. This is the next step in figuring out how to make precision agricultural methodology work to its optimum for producers. It is. So, you know, farmers, you know, you, you see us using research funds to try to improve production systems for, for you. Well, NRCS was able to give us a $4 million grant to work on this across 18 states. And we were very excited. We were one of 14 projects out of nearly 100 that got funded in this cycle. And we're trying to convert this grant into things that will benefit farmers immediately who participate, as well as those who would benefit from uh, the secondary results of this project. Well, then, how does a producer dip their toe, if you will, into this project? There was a number of ways. One is get in touch with your uh, state representative. So Kansas, that would be me. Also, uh, the overall project manager is Dave Bullock at University of Illinois, who has a dedicated team uh, who are working full time to work on this. So feel free to contact him directly. If not, uh, you can go through me and I'll make that connection. The project does have its own web page and it's as easy as searching for data intensive farm management project. You can find out more or you can contact Terry and the agmanager.info website is as easy as any way to find his contact information, agmanager.info. So this is a very exciting next step, Terry, in the area of precision agricultural technology and introducing more ideas in this field. So we wish you and all of those involved in this project the best, and we appreciate the comments right here. Thanks, Eric. It's great to be here. He's a precision agricultural economist with K-State Research and Extension is Terry Griffin. We'll be back after these moments away. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. This is the K-State Radio Network, and you're tuned to Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. For you now, today's agricultural news headlines in brief. These courtesy in part of DTN. Well, the USDA has announced new investments aimed at promoting ethanol production and consumption. Here's more from the USDA's Stephanie Ho. 
Ag Secretary Sonny Perdue announced that USDA has invested $22 million to recipients in 14 states to increase American ethanol and biodiesel sales. It's going to create pumps that are convenient for consumers to use for E15, E30, E85. Well, I'm having to go hunt for it in the back of the station somewhere. The new program is called the Higher Blends Infrastructure Incentive Program, which has up to $100 million in grants available. When we were energy dependent several years ago, this was a renewable fuel standard that developed. Corn farmers rose to the occasion. Ethanol producers rose to the occasion. Biodiesel producers rose to the occasion. He made the announcement during a visit to southern Minnesota and northern Iowa. We figure, calculate just back of the envelope, it may mean as much as 175 million more bushels of corn going into these pumps. This is Stephanie Ho for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington D.C. Two scientists, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna, were awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry on Wednesday for their work developing CRISPR, the gene editing tool. The two developed CRISPR-Cas9, as it's known, independently back in 2012. Charpentier is a French scientist directing a science of pathogens in Berlin, Germany. Doudna, an American scientist working out of the University of California at Berkeley. The award has special significance to the agricultural industry, which has seen firsthand the unique capabilities of gene editing to speed up the complicated process of breeding new crop traits and bringing them to market. To Tools like CRISPR, allowing scientists to snip out or add precise bits of DNA into animal and plant genomes, those have been embraced by U.S. agricultural scientists and regulators alike. Most recently, the USDA announced finalization of a new rule for regulating biotechnology, which would exempt many crop traits produced by gene editing techniques. Now, the agency, to note, is playing catch up with this rule, given that the U.S. agricultural scientific community and companies have already sought and received deregulation decisions for gene-edited crops and plants since 2016. In the past four years, the number of gene-edited crop traits submitted to the USDA for review has rapidly increased, from large agricultural conglomerates to small startup companies and academic institutions. Want to note that the Kansas Center for Agricultural Resources and the Environment is planning to host those two tailgate talks next week in Ellis and Russell counties in the central part of the state. The first of these will be this coming Monday, October the twelfth. It'll be hosted by the Binder family at Pleasant View Farms near Hayes. That'll feature a look at alternative water sources for livestock use and how to make cover crops work. Speakers from K State Research. And extension will be discussing existing feed sources in cattle operations. The second event is next Tuesday, the 13th. It'll be hosted by Rob Corley on his farm in Russell County. On that day, the speakers will be demonstrating how to install a tire tank for livestock use, and will discuss how to incorporate cover crops into livestock grazing plants. Now, each day's presentation will begin at eight o'clock. It'll conclude around ten thirty, and uh, then、uh, those interested do need to register beforehand. And the easiest way to do so is call this number seven eight five seven six nine three two nine seven. We'll repeat that seven eight five seven six nine three two nine seven. Or you can find out more at the K Care website. That's K C A R E dot K S U. dot edu. These two tailgate talks coming up Monday and Tuesday in Ellis and Russell counties, respectively. Now it's on to this week's Kansas wheat scoop. Here's Marcia Boswell. Support from the Farm Safety Net should be hitting farmers' mailboxes or accounts soon. Now that the final marketing year or MYA prices are set for wheat, corn, sorghum, and soybeans. These prices are an important piece of determining the payment rates under the PLC and ARC programs. With the release of the Agricultural Prices Report by USDA on September 30th, the 2019-2020 MYA prices are now final. The wheat price was finalized last month at $4.58, with a corresponding PLC payment of $0.92 cents per bushel. These payments will be received later this month. A PLC payment is issued when the effective price is less than the reference price. The reference price is currently set at five dollars and fifty cents, 
while the effective price is determined by either the national average loan rate or the MYA price, whichever is higher. The difference between the effective price and the reference price sets the payment rate. For the 2019-2020 wheat crop, the difference between the $5.50 reference price and the MYA price of $4.58 generated the $0.92 cent per bushel payment rate. K-State also released estimates for the MYA price for the 2020-2021 wheat crop. At $4.76, a PLC payment of $0.74 cents per bushel would be issued in October 2021. According to K-State, to calculate total expected payment, farmers should multiply the PLC payment rate by their farm PLC yield. Then multiply that total by 85% of base acres. The result is the total expected PLC payment for that farm. ARC co-payments are also influenced by the MYA price, but these payments are triggered based on county-level revenue and yield data rather than a national reference price. When actual county revenue falls below a crop's guarantee for the program, a payment is triggered. Benchmark revenue is calculated using a five-year Olympic average, multiplied by the five-year Olympic average county yield. That figure is then multiplied by 86%, setting the ARCCO guarantee. Actual crop revenue is then determined by multiplying the county yield by the MYA price. If this calculation falls below the ARCCO guarantee, a payment is triggered based on the difference between benchmark revenue and actual crop revenue. Farmers would receive a payment equal to that difference, multiplied by 85% of base acres for that commodity. One additional note, payments cannot exceed 10% of the ARCCO benchmark revenue. K-State estimated wheat needs an MYA price below $4.87 to generate an ARC payment. The USDA's Farm Service Agency signaled it would start processing both PLC and ARC payments as early as this week, meaning farmers should see those payments rolling in, either via direct deposit or physical check, in the near future. Stay up to date on all these updates to these programs at agmanager.info. For Kansas Wheat, I'm Marsha Boswell. Thanks, Marsha. Mary Knapp and the latest Kansas weather outlook are up next here on Agriculture Today. When you are in need of timely, reliable, and trusted information, K-State Research and Extension is here. Whether it's organizing people, information, or resources, they have the necessary tools. Community comes first for K-State Research and Extension. For more information and to connect with your county's extension agents, visit www.ksre.k-state.edu. Welcome back to Agriculture Today, and it's our time once again to talk Kansas agricultural weather with climatologist Mary Knapp, K-State Research and Extension. She's along with us each Friday. Well, Mary, that October forecast you shared a couple of weeks back and then repeated last week, uh, it's holding true to form, unfortunately. The dryness persists in this state. Yes, uh, this last week, the statewide average precipitation was zero. Each of the divisional averages were zero. There is a tiny sliver in southeast Kansas that has uh, measurable precipitation. Barely. Barely. Parsons Mesonet had the greatest amount, and that was 11 hundredths of an inch, which is about half of what they would normally expect on uh, a day, not the week. So, yes, it was dry, very, very dry. Um, So for those that are trying to get their crops harvested, get their beans in, in, probably getting started on the sorghum, very nice fall weather. For those that have dusted in wheat or are getting ready to put wheat in, or if they've got some cover crops that they wanted to get up and going, not nearly so favorable. For the record, you say, though, the drought monitor has held steady from last time to this. There were a few very slight changes, a little bit of uh, worsening in West Central Kansas, and again, some creep of the abnormally dry um, to match up with other states, with uh, Nebraska and with Missouri. But again, not much of a change. And one of the things to keep in mind is that we did have a very large expansion of the abnormally dry conditions last week. 
and conditions tend to change much more slowly as we go into our winter season. And that would be true for both improving conditions and deteriorating conditions. Unfortunately, there's nothing on the horizon that would suggest conditions are going to improve in the next probably two weeks at least. Well, and accompanying the dry conditions, warmer temperatures, warmer than it would normally be at this stage of October. It was warmer than normal, not quite as extreme as we might think, uh, about two to three degrees warmer than normal for the week. Um, We are still cooler than normal for the month to date because we were so extremely cool to start October. Mm -hmm. The outlook is that the next week should be pretty close to seasonal average. It will be slightly on the warmer side, but not quite as warm as we've been this week. Um, Nighttime low temperatures are still dropping into comfortable ranges um, in the 50s and 60s, which is slightly warmer than we would expect, but not, again, obsessively so. As we go into the following week, not this week coming up, but the week after that, we take a dive off the cliff again and go into very cold conditions. By very cold, we're looking at highs that may reach the lows that we see this week. And that means in the 60s? It's 50s and 60s for highs as we start the week after next. So that brings to mind when the widespread hard freeze might check in. Well, again, there are some places that have already had their first freeze of the season. But for a widespread killing freeze, we're still looking down the road for that. That's not going to happen in this next week and may not happen in the week following. For example, the low for Manhattan in that following week is looking to be in the mid-30s. When we look at average dates for the first frost for eastern Kansas, it's somewhere around the 14th of October. Southeast Kansas, it's a little bit later, but it doesn't look like the eastern parts of the state are going to experience that freeze anytime soon. Well, at least harvest will progress unabated, like you said, for the foreseeable future, but it's Absolutely worth mentioning here, Mary, that with our dryness, warmer temperatures of late, and these quite low humidities, the rangeland fire danger has escalated considerably in several parts of Kansas. Right. They have actually had red flag warnings out in southwest and west central Kansas already this week, and it looks like that may extend into the weekend. And particularly as we move into next week, again, the winds are going to also pick up, which will make for difficulty in controlling any fire that might get started. And what might be even worse will be the start of the following week when we not only will have still the strong winds, but we'll have the rapidly changing direction in the winds. So a fire could get started and then have very erratic behavior. It's a reminder for anyone that's going to be out in the countryside to be alert to that fire danger. Um, Be careful not to have anything that would make sparks. And if you want to um, have that nighttime campfire, be very, very cautious. You're going to want to make sure that you're well away from any of the surrounding burnable material because it won't take much to set things off. And there is plenty of fuel load out there already. Right. We did have moisture in the spring. We did have moisture in late summer. There's a lot of vegetation out there that could go. And lastly, Mary, is there any remote chance of any kind of rain event building in the Pacific that would help our situation? Well, there are three tropical systems in the Pacific, in the East Pacific, which would be um, potential for bringing some moisture up across Mexico and the desert southwest. Unfortunately, they look to be traveling more westerly than northeasterly, which would be needed to bring it in our venue. And there's a very large stretch of dry country that that moisture would have to cross in order to make it into southwest Kansas. Not a whole lot of hope with that. 
They do have a very slight chance of rain with that second cold front coming through, but we're looking at less than a 20% chance, um, barely worth mentioning. So prepare to endure dry weather for quite a while yet. Mary, thanks for coming by. Enjoy your weekend. Thanks, Eric. You as well. Climatologist Mary Knapp, K-State Research and Extension with us. And that's our time for the day and for the week. Our thanks to you for joining us. Please be back here with us on Monday, won't you? Until then, Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today over to K-State Radio Network.